I entitled this lesson tonight, um, A Whole Lot of Trouble, or A Lot of Trouble, you understand. Uh, I want to talk about getting in trouble. It's a play on words. I didn't know. Most people are like, why is he going to talk about a whole lot of trouble? So, uh, so a whole lot of trouble. Uh, we're going to talk about um, uh, mistakes, uh, punishment or judgment, uh, and rectifying mistakes. Talking about the categories of mistakes. And we'll start by reading the text from chapter 18, starting with, um, I think it would be best to start with verse 16. Yes, chapter 18, verse 16. Ms. Vaughn? So the men got up from there and gazed down toward Sodom, while Abraham walked with them to escort them. And Hashem said, Shall I conceal from Abraham what I do, now that Abraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him? For I have loved him, because he commands his children and his household after him, that they keep the way of Hashem, doing charity and justice, in order that Hashem might then bring upon Abraham that which he had spoken of him. So Hashem said, Because the outcry of Sodom and Gomorrah has become great, and because their sin has been very grave, I will descend and see. If they act in accordance with this outcry which has come to me, then destruction. And if not, I will know. The men turned from there and went to Sodom, while Abraham was still standing before Hashem. Abraham came forward and said, Will you also stamp out the righteous along with the wicked? What if there should be 50 righteous people in the midst of the city? Would you still stamp it out rather than spare the place for the sake of the 50 righteous people within it? It would be sacrilege to you to do such a thing, to bring death upon the righteous along with the wicked. So the righteous will be like the wicked. It would be sacrilege to you. Shall the judge of all the earth not do justice? And Hashem said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous people in the midst of the city, then I will spare the entire place on their account. Okay, let's stop right there. So we have um, uh, the circumstance in which Abraham is escorting the angels out to their next mission. And this time he still has the Shekinah of God with him, the presence of Hashem. And... Um, he hears Hashem communicate to the angels, saying, should we disclose what we're, what we're getting ready to do? And I'm thinking Abraham is now a bit, little, a bit shocked at what's going on, and, and he realizes, oh my goodness, these, these angels, not all of them came to talk to me about my wife Sarah and my son, my, my, my new child coming. There's destruction that's getting ready to come upon the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And there was more than just one city. When we think Sodom and Gomorrah, there were like three or four or five cities. So anyway, uh, this whole region was the region around what is now called the Dead Sea, right? So that area was um, a, a Mediterranean paradise, a huge lake, incredible bounty of fish and fruit and vegetables, greenlands, farmlands, unbelievable, very beautiful. They said it was considered the Garden of God. So if you can imagine like the Garden of Eden. Incredible place. <clears throat> we know now why Lot settled in the place because it was too tempting to not do it. Um, and I want to give a little background history here. So when Abraham realized that they were going to, that, that uh, the angel was going to go down and visit the place and sort of evaluate whether what God heard was the cries of injustice that were coming from people, that he was the angel's job was to go down and test them and to see if what God heard was really true. And if, the, if the cries were as harsh and strong as the wickedness of the place. And if so, complete destruction was going to take place. Well, Abraham hears this and he makes a, a passionate argument uh, with God, a plea. It was more than just please save them. He actually gave uh, a very eloquent, um, what do you call it, eloquent argument as to why he should save them. And the text says, says here, he says, um, <clears throat> uh, 
uh, verse 20, And God said to Abraham, Since the outcry of Sodom and, and uh, Gomorrah uh, has become great, and since their sin has become very grave, I will descend now and see if uh, they have actually caused the outcry which has reached me and the destruction. If not, I, I will know how to punish them. The angels turned from there, and Abraham to escort them there. He says, then he asked them, will you destroy the righteous with the wicked? This is the argument. Hold on a second. You are going to destroy the righteous with the wicked. Now at this point, we have to understand that what God knows, man does not know. Right? For example, if we go to um, analyze the trouble someone is in, some trouble that someone causes, you have to look at the cause and effect of their trouble and only judge that. You, you can't really judge the internal mechanisms of a person's motive. You have to just say your decision, what you made, what you did, had the negative results, therefore the negative results must demand that you are punished or corrected in some way. God, on the other hand, understands the very nuances and motive of a person's heart. He understands at the highest level. So what God was looking at was not just the fact that people had been abused, that it was a perverted society, that, uh, that corruption was at the highest level of the society. He was looking at the fact that at the very core, these people, even if they were presented with an opportunity to do good, they would do evil. Hashem knew that. He knew that, but he was going to send the angel to double-check that. Now, what was it about Sodom and Gomorrah and this area where Lot went to? What was the trouble of this place? We're going to talk about the history first. Then we're going to talk about making decisions, good or bad decisions. And what is, what is the result of your decisions? What is a test that comes at the hand of Hashem? And what is, it come, what is a test that comes at the hand of our stupidity? There's a difference, right? We should look at that as there's a difference. There are tests that comes by the hand of God that He brings to us because He's wanting to refine us and bring refinement to our neshamas. And then there are some of us who are stupid and make bad decisions and therefore are tested. And uh, you know we're ready to blame God on it. However... We're going to find out at the end of this lecture that those two tests have the same purpose, to bring refinement. And actually also bring good, ultimately to bring good. Even the stupidest, the most outlandish decisions that we make have a purpose to bring about the ultimate good, right? Okay. So he begs the angel to, uh, he begs God, would you spare for 50? Now, the 50, meaning 10, being a minion, of ten individuals in each town. There were five towns. So will you spare them if we can find ten people in each town? And then at that point, God says, yeah, well, I'll spare them for ten. And then I guess Abraham's thinking, mm, I, know the ter- I know the area. <laughs> How about five in each town? All right? So it comes down to this very fact that town's going to be destroyed anyway because that's not even the case. Lot, though not a purely evil man, was, had made a decision to be in a very negative place. Lot seems to have been a fairly righteous man, maybe not at the level of a tzaddik like Abraham. Nevertheless, Lot was living in this place called Sodom and Gomorrah, living in this region. When we remember the Parsha uh, a couple of weeks ago, Lot and Abraham have a difficulty with their animals, right? They, they were they're shepherds for Lot's Lot. They both came out of this last incident of testing with a lot of possessions, animals, sheep, herds, wealth. But Lot's herdsmen did not have the ethics that was taught by Abraham to his servants. Abraham's servants were truly reflective of the zadikim, of the zait righteousness of, 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 of Abraham. Lot's servants were just hired hands that come on, and Lot just didn't spend a whole lot of time trying to train his guys in leadership and social value and ethics, right? And so his guys would tend to encroach on the territory of another area 
allow animals to breed and you know you steal animals that breed from another animal, et cetera, et cetera. It just was not a good place. So Abraham says, let's make a decision to, to divide ourselves, put some space between us. So he gives Lot the decision to, or makes, he says, make a decision where you want to go. So Lot chooses to go to this place called Sodom and Gomorrah. According to the Midrash, Sodom and Gomorrah was a very wealthy, well-to-do place, these cities. And there were very little poor there. I mean, hardly any poor people came around because they were so prosperous. And, and then when a poor person came around, they were abused, generally would be killed or destroyed. They had no sense of compassion upon a, a wayfarer or a stranger. Hashem reminds His people later on to constantly entreat the gear of the stranger, be kind to the stranger, right? These people were the opposite of that. If anything, they went out of their way to find, uh, they would go out of their way to, to perpetrate crimes against the stranger. Why? Because they were strangers. Who would miss them? And the whole society was this way. And how do we know that? We know that because we see that there are seven, there are seven reasons why the dwellers of Sodom, uh, in Sodom and Sodom should be uh, expected to refrain from harm in the angels. The angels gave them seven ways to keep from doing anything negative. Seven ways. Did that go off? Good. Good. Huh? Yeah. Okay. So seven ways that it is that he gave the people of Sodom an opportunity to... Um, let me turn this off. Everybody's eyes are there. I know. We're wondering what's going to do. Yeah. If you see the face of Hasatan come on there, then warn me. Other than that, let's focus on the message, right? So the angels give seven opportunities for the people to not perpetrate any crime or violence at, at some level demonstrating the highest level of mercy. To say, we're going to give you all excuses not to do anything. And if you still do it, you deserve nothing but utter and complete destruction. So let's go through and enumerate these things. The guest arrived in the evening. So they could not be faulted for having to stay rather than to travel at night. So the idea is they arrived at the evening, and if you know that you have a stranger coming to your place in the evening, you wouldn't expect them to travel at night. I mean, it just makes good Common sense, I don't care who you are, you don't have to be a Zadik to know that if somebody comes and they're traveling at night and you come past your town, you would not expect them to continue on their way. You would give them some place of refuge. Second, Lot, who would welcome them in, was sitting at the gate, an expression that alludes, uh, uh, alludes to his status as a judge in Sodom, which would seem to be the reason for the mob to let his guests stay in peace. So the second way that the angels gave them an opportunity to not do something horrible was to say, yes, we have chosen Lot to be a judge in the city. He has authority. And so if this is what he chooses to do, then he will keep us from doing these things because he's a righteous judge. Okay? Third thing. Third thing. Furthermore, Lot had uh, initiated the invitation. He stood up and went toward them. So the guests were not responsible for the sin of taking hospitality. The reason why is if the people knew that these people imposed themselves on the town, then the townspeople could have some, maybe at some level have a reason to say, you imposed yourself on us, and that's why you are a stranger and we should deal harmfully to you. But instead, Lot approaches them and the guests were not responsible for the sin of taking on hospitality, meaning the guest could not have in any way provoked it. They didn't come and say, we want to be invited into the town. Lot invited them. So therefore, they are on Lot's level of, of uh, responsibility. Lot did not take them around the city, but rather told them to come inside the house of your servant, making sure not to cause a public scene with this inv invitation to the guest. So the fourth reason, or fourth thing is, is the angels with Lot, and at this time, 
avoided every opportunity not to get the people of the town riled up. I mean, they went way out of the way to not let the town members know that they were going to Lot's house. But all it took was one guy to see this, that when the town came, everybody showed up, right? It wasn't just a couple of guys. Everybody in the town showed up. There was like a mob at the door. So this one guy that said, hey, do you know what I saw? I saw three strangers going into Lot's house. What did they, how did they respond? I mean, they just showed up as a mob. Next, he asked them to remain with their feet dirty and only to wash in the morning before leaving. What did Abraham do? Wash your feet first before you come in the tent. Lot was in Sodom, and it was, eh, he's a righteous man, but not quite like Abraham. You wash your feet later. But there's also this attitude here to make it clear that the red, to the residents of Sodom that they were planning on on leaving immediately and not having an extended stay. So we invite them in, don't wash your feet, they're not staying long. So another message transmitted to the people to say, they're not going to be here long, don't bother. Okay? Next, he invited them with an explicit condition that they would stay only until the morning, at which time they would be expected to rise early and go. Next, even after hearing Lot's invitation, they initially refused. The angels refused. Why are they refusing? They are giving every opportunity for these people not to do something that would cause further judgment on them. Right? We will sleep in, on the street instead. Finally agreeing only after he uh, uh, pressured them greatly. Even then they did not request food, but ate only because they, they had prepared a meal for them. Although the people of Sodom had these factors turning them from violent action, giving them an excuse not to be violent against the wayfarers, they found it in, imperative to follow their selfish beliefs. They surrounded the house as in a siege and emphasized to the use of the word al, or rather than s, the presence of the mob for all elements of society from young to old, they were, they were all there. From the young guys to the old men, they were all there. Underscoring the universal acceptance of the evil way of life in Sodom, this behavior under such circumstance sealed their fate and left no avenue to judge them, but to judge them. So now we're in this situation where every possible avenue of mercy was was providing them to show some level of kindness, a last-ditch effort. Now, we're going to leave this, and then we're going to come back to it, because we want to now begin to build on this idea of a lot of trouble. Lot chose to be where he was at. He chose to be there. He knew very well what he was facing when he went there. He knew the type of people that was there. But money talks. Some people will do whatever it takes to have security and wealth, and even if it means being around those type of people. The decision. Notice that Abraham never even, never darkened the door of Sodom and Gomorrah. He, why didn't he tell the angel, look, let, let me go down and talk to my nephew, let me talk to a few people and see if I can change their mind. He wouldn't even go to the city. He wouldn't be tainted by it. Lot is the category of individuals who, makes, who, who make bad decisions. And in making these bad decisions, they, they bring down the judgment of God. Or they bring down the correction of God. What is the purpose of correction? To fix us, right? Do you think God wanted to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, really? He would have preferred that they would have repented. And I believe that he gave the angels that opportunity to go really double-check before complete destruction comes, give an opportunity. What if they would have showed up at Lot's house and instead of them coming up and wanting to rape the angels, let's build a banquet for them and ask them to stay a few days longer. Could have totally changed the whole, whole picture. Lot is one of these people who feels that they can keep both feet in two worlds. 
I can, I can continue to make decisions that are motivated by my ego and by my pride, and yet at some level maintain my level of righteousness, right? We all have been there at time, okay? So we, we understand where he's coming from. But you and I both know you can't go into a filthy place and not expect to, to, not, to get dirty, right? You, it's just going to happen. I don't care how hygienically you know, focused you are. If you go to a place that is filthy, you're going to get dirty. You may not be as dirty as the person who wallows in it, the pig, but you're going to get dirty. Lot's decision to go to these cities, maybe he had good intention. Maybe he felt like I could be like my uncle, Abraham, Abraham Avinu. I could go to these places and I can demonstrate great light and people will see and respect that. But what ended up happening, Lot, in some aspects, fell from a place of righteousness that he that he'd had when he was with his uncle to the place to where he would offer his daughters to the men. Instead of raping the guests, rape my daughters. Profound, isn't it? I don't get it either. Profound. This is a man who, after seeing the miraculous nature of the angels, you know, speak a word and blow these guys out the front door of the house. He still didn't want to leave. Why didn't he want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah? He couldn't bring himself to think that God would actually destroy a place that has given him so much blessing. Just couldn't see. It just doesn't make sense. How could, why would God destroy such a beautiful place? Yes, there's some bad people here, but, you know, I'm a good guy. Why would he want to destroy all this? Plus, this is the way I make my living. All of my pranasa, my money comes from this location. What, why would he want to destroy this place? Instead, he waited until the angels had to drag him out of the city. Lot went to his, his son-in-laws, and he told them to, uh, to go with him. They laughed at him because they thought he was acting like a comedian. They just thought it was funny. They couldn't bring themselves to think that this is actually going to happen. Lot is literally grabbed up his wife and two daughters and grabbed by the nap of the neck and drug out of the city. The, the angels tell um, Lot and his family, don't look back. Now we're looking at the why people get in trouble because they're fools versus why people have tests because Hashem guides them to those tests. Lot is foolish because he's driven by his ego. His wife is foolish because she is driven by her ego. What does she do but turn around to look at the destruction of the city and is turned to a pillar of salt? This test, this series of bad decisions, just continue to go to worse decisions. Lot's first bad decision was making the, to making. Uh, the critical mistake of going to Sodom and Gomorrah to settle there, right? The second one is to think that as a, a judge, if he got voted into the system, that he could actually change the system. He tried his best. But the system ended up making changes in him that were critical because Hashem was willing to destroy the whole city even with him in it. And because of the prayers of Abraham Avinu, because he prayed and, and, and uh, proceeded to appeal to God, God spared his nephew but they barely got his nephew out of the city. Barely got him out of the city. When they, were, when they were running, the angel said, run straight ahead, go to the hills, go to the mountain. There's sort of a metaphor the Hasidic masters talk about when you're leaving your place of destruction and bad decisions and you're attempting to Hashem to bring correction in your life, you don't run horizontally. You run straight, straight up. Straight up to what? We go to Mount Zion, right? We go to Mount Zion. We, we, go to, uh, we go to where the Torah was given to Moshe. We head up. It's to elevate yourself. If you are horizontally moving, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere horizontally moving. But what does Lot do? He says, please, I can't make it. Maybe he was too old. I, I can't imagine him being too old. But he says, I can't make it up the mountain. If I go, it'll overtake me and I'll, I'll drop dead. So let us run to this other, other city. It's a new city. And they're not as evil as the last city. And you could spare that. If you spare that city, 
allow us to go and you can spare that city, work the deal. And that's primarily the reason why they believed that that city was spared. And a lot was, a lot was allowed to go in. Once again, Hashem showing him the mercy. But they end up running into a cave, right, to hide from the destruction. When they turned around and saw that the actual earth opened up and an earthquake came and it folded itself over and all of the, the mineral and salt deposits in the earth deposited itself on top of what was this beautiful valley, ensuring that from that time to this day, nothing would grow in that place. That the lake or the Red Sea, or I mean the um, Dead Sea, would be a dead sea. Nothing would grow into that. However, we have a reversal of that that's coming in the end of days. And in Zechariah 14, it talks about the day that the water will flow from Zion and wake up the sea again. Incredible, incredible idea that we understand that what happens, God is going to reverse. He's going to bring around. Now, we're going to continue to talk about the, the trouble that Lot gets into because of his bad decisions. What does Hashem do? They find themselves in a cave and they think that they are the only people alive. Now mind you, think about this for a second. How much of an ego do you have when you think that everything you lost, if you lost everything, everybody in the world must have lost it? Did you guys see the video that Jimmy Kibble did with the kids in Easter candy? I mean, uh, Halloween candy, same thing. Halloween candy? Right? You see the one little boy is like, my whole life is ruined now, right? You're ruining my life, right? That's not like something you'd hear from Izzy, maybe. Huh? <laughs> You're ruining my life. I mean, we all think that's funny and it's cute because it's a little one. But there are adults just like that. Right? Because something doesn't go their way. You feel like ever, their comfort zone has been, you know, affected. Their whole life is falling apart because, you know, how many times I've seen people who wreck a car and they think it's the end of the world, right? At least you weren't killed in the accident, right? So they get there and the daughters figure there's nobody left, so we need to procreate and have children. And so another bad decision creates a, another bad decision. You see, flawed thinking that comes from ego is what is the garden bed of bad decisions. Because they thought they were the only people alive, then surely they must make the bad decision to procreate. And what comes out of that bad decision? Uh, let's first talk about the bad. I'm going to talk about the bad. We're going to end the good at the end. Who comes out? What tribes come out of the bad decision? The Moabites and the Amorites. Who, who gives Israel the hardest time when they come out heading toward Canaan? The Moabites and the Amorites. What about the great curse that came from the story of Pinchas comes from this group of people? That is why Hashem said that nobody in the Moabite camp should ever become a convert. Right? However, something changed. Ruth, Ruth. So, why do I say all this? I say this, that in spite of our stupidity and our bad reasoning, our ego, that Hashem can turn things around. And why does He turn things around? And this is what we have to remember. Did He do it because of Lot or did He do it because of Abraham? Abraham. Why do you think He brings Mashiach from the line of Ruth? Because of Avraham Avinu. That is why it is not because of Lot and his good thought process. It is not because of his daughters were great, great hachams, great wise women that made these decisions. It was because he did it for Avraham. Because Avraham stood up and said that if you destroy the righteous with the wicked, what are people going to think? In reality, Avraham knew that he had no level of merit when it came to being like Avraham. He had none. Lot figured, I'm, I'm nothing. If the great righteous man called Avraham sees himself as dust and ashes, then who am I? Now, let's look at the other, the other side. There is the testing that comes because of our stupid decisions. 
And it's interesting because a person who is tested by their stupidity usually are blaming God. Have you noticed that? Why does God always do these things to me? Right? They're making dumb decisions in their life. They're making illogical decisions, decisions that are against Torah-based thinking, but they want to blame God for it, right? Let's look at the other side of a zadik, a righteous person, who is tested not because of their stupidity, but tested because Hashem wants to bring about righteousness. Abraham is asked after he has this young boy to bring him to sacrifice him on the altar. That's a huge test. Now, we all know that God does not promote human sacrifice, and we know at the beginning of this test, it says it very clearly, that God wanted to test Abraham, meaning no intention of ever sacrificing his son. That was not the point. The point was the test. It wasn't the sacrifice. Abraham went through and passed the test. Can you imagine how trying that was? Can you imagine... Abraham complaining to God, why are you doing this to me? Why are you asking me of this? I can't believe that you would impose this on me. No. What is the difference between Abraham and Lot? And why does Abraham have certainty and Lot does not? Why would you think? Connection to Hashem. Connection to Hashem. Mm -hmm. It's the difference. It's Imuna. At the coon, right? Or, or trust. Lot had a connection to Abraham, who had a connection to Hashem. Lot was at some level of righteousness above the rest of the world because of his connection to, to Abraham, not to Hashem. There are many people in the world who attach themselves to a Zadik, and Rabbi Nachman of Brislav says that a person who attaches himself to a Zadik, even if the Zadik is at the lowest level, it's as if at some level they're attaching themselves to Hashem. Mm -hmm. These are the words of Rabbi Nach. Mm -hmm. Rabbi Nach. So if a person attaches himself to a higher level of Zadik, then he is attaching himself at some level to Hashem at a higher level. But nevertheless, there is no substitute for connecting to Hashem. You see, we're not asked to use an intermediary to connect to Hashem. God wants us to connect to Him directly. However, there are some people who just never do that. And they, they do the best that they can to connect. Welcome, come on in, have a seat. They do the best they can to connect to Hashem, and they do a great job, right? But then there are others who find it easier just to connect to someone in the real, in the, what do you call it, in the present world. So the difference between Lot and Abraham really wasn't about having wealth because both had great wealth. It wasn't about the desire to... Uh, to be the big player, because here Lot was a judge in Sodom. Uh, it really wasn't so much about living in a negative area, though negativity does bring a person down. Okay, So we all know that uh, the environment that we keep influences us. So if we're constantly around negativity, it's going to drag us down. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, we learn from, uh, the, from Rebbe Nachman, who says, that an individual who uh, even finds himself in the most righteous place, right, but that is not connected, that place is not connected to elevated thought and ideas, it'll drag you down. You won't bring it up. Though we try our best in our life to bring and elevate the environment around us, the tukun alam, right? So the difference between Abraham and Lot was simple. Hashem says that Abraham was a friend. He had connections with Abraham. So why does Hashem take a descendant of this really strange, incestuous relationship and bring the Mashiach? Because of Abraham. Because Abraham stood on that valley side as he saw the angels disappear over the horizon. And there he cries out to Hashem and says, you destroy the whole city? Oh, you're going to destroy the righteous with the wicked? That doesn't make sense. It makes this passionate appeal. 
And in the end, when we tell this story and we understand that Ruth comes from the Moabite and the Mashiach comes from Ruth, that really the idea is that redemption came out of a very simple prayer that Abraham made. The prayer of a Zadik is a powerful prayer. That's why when we have difficulties in our life, we try to attach ourselves to someone who is a righteous person who can elevate and say prayers for us. Very important. Never underestimate the power of a prayer from a righteous person. But Abraham makes an appeal which most people would have passed over and says, well, his prayer was answered. But his prayer hasn't been fully answered yet. I want you to follow me for just a second. What is the redemption of the world supposed to be? That Hashem does not destroy the wicked with the righteous. Hashem says, I take no pleasure in destroying the wicked. Right? I take no pleasure in destroying wicked people. But that all would come to repentance, right? He says, every soul belongs to me. A soul that repents lives. A soul that doesn't repent dies. So what is Hashem wanting to do? He brings Mashiach out of, of the Moabites, Ruth, because he's demonstrating to the nations at the end of age that despite 6,000 years of mankind, mankind's destruction on mankind, and that there are righteous people who have spotted different areas throughout history, that in the end, Hashem's desire is to do what? To redeem men, to call them out of unrighteousness. But in spite of all of their unrighteousness, God will provide a Mashiach. He will provide a way to bring an anointed man that will bring about redemption in the world to come, in the age for the world to come. Why we study this today, and we study this idea of a lot of trouble, is we realize some get in trouble because of their stupidity, and some are tested because of their connection with Hashem. And if I'm going to have difficulties in my life, and if you are going to have difficulties in my life, in our life, it's going to be because of our connection with Hashem, not because we have made crazy decisions. But regardless of whether your decision was bad because of your own choice, or you being tested by the Creator of the universe, the result is the same. Hashem wants to bring about goodness in our life. He wants to restore our very name. He wants to restore our future. And ultimately, He wants to restore us in this world that we live. So that concludes the class. Any questions and answers, this would be a good time to do that. Yes. Yes, please. Questions, answers, fears, doubts, unbeliefs?